You can now start, Chairman. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, it is now 2 p.m. and we will start our meeting at this particular point in time. Let us all stand and our, say the pledge to the American flag, please. <laughs> Pledge of allegiance flag. Flag. flag of the United, United States. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice. and justice. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Our, has the meeting notice been properly posted? Certified in accordance with the law. Okay, thanks, Chancellor Head. Uh, Helen, do we have any anyone requesting to make public comments? No, Chair Smith. No one signed up for public comment today. Okay, then. Well, we'll move right into discussions, and I will turn it over to Chancellor Head. Uh, Chair Smith, I believe that uh, Trustee Lloyd just joined. Also, yes, yes, he did. Yeah, see him right. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Ken. How you doing? How's everybody doing? Good. Excellent. Great. Uh, I actually got some good news today. The uh, I've got a very quick overview before we get into Mario's part and then Jennifer's part. So this morning, the enrollments for the summer were up five percent. That's a really positive. We've been negative just about all um, coming through late spring. Are you so saying five we'll percent above last year? Yes. Cool. Well, that's wonderful. Yes. It, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. That's a real positive. So it makes a difference in our finances. And our finances, and Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about this. So we're taking a look at summer and fall. Fall is really the key. But I'll tell you, we've been, um, and you'll see in our in the presentation that we have a minus five because it was minus five yesterday. And what? What happened was we had a um, payment day due last Friday. And then what happens is if they haven't paid, then we delete them and then they turn around and sign up again. So what we're seeing is the follow up to that. It's our normal, normal patterns. We actually have more students though enroll this summer than we did last summer, which is a really good sign. Fall is still slow. We've got a long way before that. And it just depends on how you take a look at it. So if you take a long, the long view of, um, kind of where we were this time last year, we're over 30% decline. If you take the positive view, which is the times that we've, we, we started registration late. So we're about minus 20 right now, but um, that's been getting better every day. So I'm cautiously optimistic, optimistic. It has a major bearing though in our budgets. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. On the CARES Act, we have, um, We've awarded money to over 12,000 students and we'll give out about $10 million in stimulus money and we'll keep you updated on that, but that's going well. We've had more applications than, um, than we, well, it's about as many as I thought we would have. And so we've got a lot of students asking for assistance. We were also in the process of um, we sent a note out to students that dropped totally withdrew from the college. So we will be giving a total of about a million dollars back in refunds from stimulus money. And then one thing I wanted to point out to you is um, life does go on with some of this, but TWC, Texas Workforce Commission, gave us a grant this past week, $250,000 to train for training in two companies. One was Farouk's company, the cheese products. They moved their manufacturing lines from hair products to um, hand sanitizers. And so the TWC gave them money for training and then a company called 12 Stones, which is a truck driving company that's a subcontractor for Amazon. And some of you know that Amazon's been hiring a lot of people. So they were actually referred to us by a former employee who went to work for the trucking company. So slowly but surely the, the college and uh, they're getting back to we're moving in the right direction, let's put it that way. It's still gonna take a while. So what we were doing today is, two, there's two parts of this. One is I'd ask Mario, there are no action items on this. Uh, this is just an update on the meeting to talk to you about what our uh, 
return to building and return to uh, or, and working remote, what that looks like. And I sent a, I'm not sure you've had time to see it, but we sent a brochure or a copy of brochure that went out to went out to our employees yesterday. So Mario, I'm going to turn this over to you and Mario will go through this and feel free to answer any questions you might have. All right, so I'm just confirming that everyone can hear me. Yes, yes, all right. So uh, let's start with sort of the people, right? And that's why uh, I asked that sort of we start with the remote work guidelines because for a lot of our employees, that's their primary concern is essentially who has to come back to the buildings and when and who uh, gets to continue working remotely. And so it was really important for the first bullet point of this slide to make it very clear the default status for full-time employees and really all employees is working remotely, right? So we have 7,803 students and so, I'm sorry, not students, employees, 7,803 employees. And so for about 89 to 90% of them, what we've been doing since March 23rd will continue far into the summer. And so we have two groups of employees that I'll talk a little bit about more in a minute, but essentially we have the first sort of what we're calling the RTB return to building uh, prep crews. And those are the crews that basically come in and make sure that the buildings are ready for larger numbers of employees and students or any students to come back. And so for that, we have 270 between uh, May 18th and this next Monday. Um, and then we're going to add about another 600 uh, starting June 1st. So for the month of March, we're going to have roughly about nine, 900 employees that are RTB. All of those people should have been notified no later than yesterday. Um, and I personally confirmed with every cabinet member that that was going to happen. And so to the extent that you're an employee and you're out there listening, if no one has called you up until this point saying that you are being selected at least presumptively to come back on June 1st, then you can rest assured that for the time being, you are going to continue to work from home. And so that's a large part of the questions that we're getting is essentially when am I, because we understand that people have childcare issues, people are concerned for their own health and that of people that they live with. And so we wanted to make sure that that was very clear at the onset. And that same brochure that's about 10 pages uh, long, uh, we talk about sort of every sort of major employee class, right? So the first group that we talk about is uh, part-time employees. And so part-time employees um, starting June 1st are only going to be paid for actual hours worked. And they receive notification of that from the CFO as early as the 5th of May. And so we, we gave them as much notice as we can to assist them. Now, I can also tell you that along the lines of sort of, I think what makes Lone Star College a special place to work, our own HR recruiting team, because we've frozen uh, hiring, um, is going to help our part-time employees find short-term uh, work in nearby companies. And I can tell you in the last 24 hours, we've had about 50 different employees reach out to the HR recruiting department. Um, again, majority of the instruction over the summer will be online. And again, that is why 90% of our employees will remain at home instead of RT being. Um, and the main thing, you know, we get a lot of questions about fall, right? And it's sort of the person that's leading the RTB charge along with the help of my colleagues on cabinet. Um, we're basically taking it one to two weeks at a time. Um, and so fall is a long ways away when we're trying to make it to June 1st, which is the big next hurdle that we have. And so staff professional, uh, support staff, professional, and administrative staff will be working from home um, as approved. And again, that is 90% of our workforce. So as of yesterday, I know there was a lot of confusion about how are they going to treat part-time employees? How are they going to treat adjuncts full-time, et cetera, during the summer at least? And so Dr. Head released that brochure uh, yesterday. Can I get the next slide, please, Link? Thank you. And so part of sort of what's laid out in that document at a very high level is we have a lot of departments that have never worked from home, that have never worked remotely. And so those folks have been coming to HR and asking for guidance about how do we go about essentially creating KPIs and deliverables on the fly in a, in a function or department where we've never had them, right? Now, to be fair, there are certain 
divisions and offices that have had very robust online KPI tracking. And for those folks, we're basically just telling them to do what they've been doing in their offices at home. And so the same document that Dr. Head shared yesterday lays out a very high level uh, recommendation for how supervisors and uh, employees can work together. And one of the key things that I want to hone in on is a last sentence on one of those paragraphs, and that is that a, a little bit of empathy and compassion both ways goes a long way right now. And we are expecting supervisors along with employees to work with one another and to try to come to some form of agreement, whether that's flexing hours, flexing schedules, allocating for the fact that people have limited computer resources, uh, people have child care issues, and people have responsibilities that, you know, we're not just working from home, we're working from home during a pandemic. And so I think that's a really important point that we're trying to stress. And so we really are encouraging supervisors and their employees to work together and really escalate matters to HR, to legal, to Dr. Head and myself, only when they basically reach an impasse. And so that is largely a uh, big group overview of what we're trying to do with the employees again for the summer. And so let me go back to those roughly 900, um, roughly 900 employees that are going to be asked and have been asked and have graciously accepted for the most part, the responsibility of being the first and second waves of employees that are coming back into our buildings. And so what are those folks walking into? So again, the first wave of RTB employees is June 1st. We're going to open no more than 26 buildings on June 1st. We have a total of 18 checkpoints and we are going to have Monday through Sunday operations as early as 6 to 7 a.m. and as late at some places, 11 p.m. Throughout that time, there will always be a third party health screener that will screen temperatures and do health screenings to ensure that no one gains access into those buildings. But let me just take a step back and talk to you about sort of the different phases. So the phase that we're in right now, and I think a couple months ago, Dr. Head forward you a fate, what I'll call the phases PowerPoint, right? And so remember that right now we're in the limited face to face delivery phase. And so during this phase, all we're doing is trying to get the folks, the students to finish spring 2020 and essentially get a small portion of workforce courses going on. So if you look at the division and the functions of those eight to 900 employees that are coming back, by and large, the grand majority of them, 98%, I would say, are health ops folks that are coming back, right? Because those folks cannot give instruction online. They, there are regulatory and legal reasons why they have to return to those buildings to finish up. And, and so most of the people that are coming back are people like facilities, custodians, people that are cleaning and getting the buildings ready. We've had a couple of storms. We had a big storm yesterday around these parts. And so people have to come in and pick up the branches and do all that. So that's a big part of it. Then we obviously have our health occupations instructional folks the support staff for those folks, everyone who's going to be running the checkpoints. And when you add it all up across the entire system, it ru it's roughly about 10%, which I think is a very conservative move towards uh, returning to the new normal. Now, the next phase is the expanded face-to-face -face delivery period. And one of the things that I get all the time is when are we going to move from limited to expanded? And the truth is we don't know, right? Um, we don't know if we're going to move to expand it in the fall, or if maybe we'll do it in the spring. And that's largely a decision that's left up to the board of trustees and Dr. Head <laughs> to sort of uh, make that decision. But for the, the sake of right now, we're assuming on my staff and at my level that we are going to remain in the phase that we're in uh, for the foreseeable future. And so we have again, 24 to 26 buildings. We have 18 checkpoints and in order to open up a building, you basically, and you being a cabinet member, have to certify in writing that you have met roughly about 120 to 130 checkpoint items that range everything from getting the facilities ready, getting the classrooms ready, ensuring you have enough PPE on hand, ensuring that the classes have been um, separated in a way that increases social distancing. It is all sorts of 
things and I'd be happy to sort of forward you the latest one because again, and I say the latest one because it is something that we're trying to change essentially every two weeks, right? So tomorrow I've already told cabinet that I'm gonna release 1.3. Uh, that accounts for lessons learned in opening up these 26 buildings so that when we open the next buildings, we have some added advantages on how we opened up these 26 buildings. And so from May 18th through today, and actually tomorrow, we're getting these buildings ready. Then those certifications have to come in, and then we sort of go back in June. And so there's a huge spreadsheet of things that you have to do for that. Then there's another spreadsheet for things that you have to agree that once you open up the building, these are the things that you're going to do while the building is open. Then there's a third spreadsheet that is about this is what you're going to do if we get a confirmed positive. And so, for example, we used that third spreadsheet yesterday, right? When we found out about the employee over at Kingwood. And so we have, we've already used all three uh, spreadsheets more or less. There's also a digital app where we're going to track people that are coming in and out of our buildings. That's why we were able to get out that note so quickly yesterday. Uh, everyone has really helped out by keeping track of who's coming in and out of the buildings, enforcing that if you're there for one build, one of those 26 buildings, you're not going to be allowed to roam into a 27th or a 28th building, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the second wave of people, the roughly additionally 600 people are going to come in June and again, you can see there, I won't read it, what the purpose of that is. And one of the key things that we want to sort of highlight is that RTB employee hours are not expected to work the pre-pandemic hours, right? So if you have a need, and let me actually take a step back, when you turn in the list of who you would like to ask to return to building, there are numerous checks and balances on that list. And again, the brochure explains that as to how that works. So the first thing is you have to send it to me. And I started looking at sort of what are the job categories of people that you're asking? Is it equitable across the system, right? We can't have one college asking this particular rank or uh, position to come back, but not anybody else. So we're doing that. The next thing, particularly for the RTB prep crews, that first wave that's going into those buildings, I need you to tie what protocol number that employee is going to help achieve from the spreadsheet. So that way, there are no extra people. Everyone that's coming into those buildings is helping with RTB prep in a very concrete and direct way. Um, nevertheless, if you are a full-time employee, you're paid usually for 40 hours a week. We don't expect people to be on site for 40 hours a week on average, right? Most employees that have to RTB have to RTB to print checks or do something. And then the expectation is that they then leave as soon as they achieve the necessity that required them to come to the buildings. And then again, because we returned to work on March 23rd, and I want to sort of do stress that because the brochure also stresses that we, we return to work on March 23rd. And a lot of companies are using return to work and return to building interchangeably or return to office. We're not here at Lone Star, at least to the extent that I can help it. Return to work started on March 23rd and people are expected to work effective March 23rd, return to building or return to workplace. That is something that we're transitioning folks in over the course of the next few months. And so when people come into these buildings, a lot of the concern they have is about essentially what is the status of COVID uh, folks at Lone Star, right? So I'll tell you right now, we have had actually a really small number of people confirmed positive. So historically, back, back going back to March 23rd, when we first started tracking it, we have had eight employees uh, be confirmed positive of 7,803. Uh, three of them were full-time, three of them were part-time, and two of them were adjuncts. We have had 45 students. Um, unfortunately, we did have a student pass away. And so we, we have had one death of a student but we've had 45 students historically. So we're keeping track of the historical numbers. And again, we're looking at this data and modifying our plans. The next item is we literally keep track every single day of who is sick right now. And so as of today, we have 21 students that are confirmed positives and two employees with one being the one from yesterday. So we've actually had a lot of luck and good fortune with the percentage of our employees that have tested positive. And again, we are better prepared now than we've ever been to essentially deal with someone that is a confirmed positive. 
Uh, uh, like Soma. Have you been tracking the geographic locations of these people to see patterns as to where these occurrences are happening? Yes, sir. We are tracking them and they basically mirror the Harris County website almost perfectly. Um, in the beginning, it was over in the Cypher uh, 249 Beltway 8 kind of quarter that left the northwest quadrant. That was where we were getting a lot of uh, folks. And so it basically mirrors Harris County, the Harris County Health website almost very accurately. Thank you. Yes, sir. And so um, the last thing that I want to talk about with the time that I have left is the PPE, right? So we have a full blown um, distribution center slash warehouse now out of the community building at system office. And we are literally moving millions of pieces of PPE now um, seemingly every day. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we've already, not what we've ordered, what we've already delivered. We have delivered 102,000 masks to the colleges. We have given them 250,000 gloves, 8,000 face shields, 6,000 bottles of hand sanitizer, 12 ounces. And every week, starting this week, we are getting nearly a quarter of a million wipes. 230,400 to be exact is how much we're getting every week. And then we have, I mean, every single type of PPE that you could imagine, we basically have it in that warehouse. We even have, as of today, the most elusive of PPE uh, and 95 masks. And so um, we are taking orders from all cabinet members. We have a curbside pickup. If you haven't been there, I think Dr. Smith was there about a week ago. We have curbside pickup. It's very much like anything else. You drive up, we have a little sign, you text that you're there. And my staff and I walk out and load your truck for you. We yell at you if you get out of your car. Um, and we go ahead and load your stuff. And, and that's basically what we've been doing with the PPE. And so again, right now we haven't been throttling or asking people to not order too much. We are giving every single building owner as much PPE as they want so that no one has to go without PPE so that every student can be given PPE, every employee, everyone can use as much as they like and as much as they feel comfortable. And we'll worry about burn rates at another day. But right now we're just trying to get everyone comfortable with the idea that we've done the very best that we can to keep everyone safe. And with that, unless you have any other questions, I will hand it back over to Dr. Head. Any questions of Mario before we end? Mario, uh, when he said that he's talked about the distribution center, Mario and his staff have, are literally running that. I mean, Mario has been the one putting tape out there. It's, it looks like a Costco distribution center over there. And so, and on these documents that sent out, that's uh, Mario and Kyle Scott and Link Alander. <clears throat> work on this based on their own experiences. It's really good. We've been sharing it with others, uh, other colleges around. So it's about as detailed as we can get in trying to explain to people exactly what's going on. We had a webinar earlier this week. We had a thousand people there and we uh, accidentally cut the number off. So we'll have some more webinars to, we're trying to work with our employees to make sure they understand everything. And the main thing for them is um, we're trying to reduce the angst that they have about either coming back to work or working from home or exactly what our situation is. So. State so, now question. Yeah. Is there a list well, of those 26 buildings? Just out of curiosity, what, what, are, what is there a list of them? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, we send that to you, trustee. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious and why they, why, the, why they were chosen, I guess. Well, yeah. You can, you want to answer that or? You yeah. So every um, so every president and every cabinet member elected to sort of make uh, those decisions, and essentially what drives it is where can we do the workforce instruction, right? There's only so many places where you can, for example, do nursing, where you can do all the different types because we have uh, that's where we have our medical. So if you wanted sort of a big global overview of how those buildings were picked, it's the health sciences. Anything having to do with health sciences is usually so. For example, at Tomball, their HSB at Kingwood, their HSB at uh, North Harris, same thing. And so essentially, um, that's what it is. Of course, we have the two system offices. Um, and so 
you know, some some colleges have five buildings. For example, that's what North Harris has. Uh, mm -hmm. North Harris has five. Cipher has four, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it just depends basically on what their course offerings are. I, I'm, I'm first. I'm just complimenting you. You seem like you pick the buildings that are where the need is the most with respect to the community. Okay, excellent. So, um, just so you'll know, we were trying to get these students in. What Mario indicated. So we had a number of students that were not able to finish their spring semester, especially on the workforce side. And I, I might add the hospitals have notified, a couple of hospitals have notified us and they're going to start taking clinicals again or offering clinicals, letting us offer clinicals, which is a really good sign. It's just a gradual reopening for everything. But, and we're taking a look, we're submitting some um, documentation to the coordinating board to offer some other workforce programs this summer. We just, um, can't we're trying to give all these students the opportunity if you're not if they can't do it online then we want to be really careful and be safe but we know we can do this through social distancing and all the safety precautions so we'll keep doing right. if, if uh trustee lloyd wants a list i have no problem i have it right here no no, no 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 don't don't hi Marion. okay we're good so um, I want to know who the Radar O'Reilly of the system is that managed to obtain all of the PPE. <laughs> and, and I commend you for making the decision that what's important is making sure that everybody has enough to feel comfortable coming back, doing what they need to do, and we'll worry about the burn rate later. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Steve, would you put me line? Mike Sullivan? Yeah. Just a, um, an observation, uh, looking at this from a management perspective, Mario is intimately aware of the most minute detail with respect to this operation. I'm wondering if that takes him away from the other responsibilities he has as COO, and even if the answer is no, it doesn't. Then at what point would it be fair for us to see someone else take over the, um, the operations on the ground, if you will, that he seems to be running so well? well right now, he is functioning to me the way the CEO ought to. He's coordinating all these activities, which um, I know the presidents and the vice chancellors are on the line. And that in itself is a full time job, just so. Uh, and I'm saying that with a smile on my face, but it is. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer and I and the rest of us have been working on the budgets, and that's an everyday issue. But Mario has a really top-notch staff over there. Mario, you just want to talk just for a second about your staff and how we're handling that. And that's a good question. I've asked the same question. So Mario. Yes, sir. So first of all, the, the procurement function to answer uh trustee good, that is Jennifer Mott's group, right? So they have oh. done really they have done a really good job of sourcing the materials and essentially I take control of them literally when they get delivered in the loading dock. And so she has staff there that verify that we are getting what we paid for. And then my staff and I take over um, when um, it gets delivered. And then once it gets delivered, then we re inventory it ourselves for our purposes. And so that's how we're keeping track of what's coming in and out. And, you know, I don't work alone. I have a great staff and they're empowered to sort of help me in a great way. And so I think that's been part of a lot of part of the success that I have, you know, when my chief of staff, my deputy general counsel, they've all stepped up. And I think all of them are as committed as I am to ensuring that we do all we can to get these students back on track. This is Mike Stillman and Mario, the, the fact of the matter is, is Steve as well, has changed. I mean, this has changed the way you're, you're doing business and you have to do business to cope with this. So I want to just commend all of you for making this change in a rapid, uh, a rapid period of time. And so you, you have to kind of adapt and do what you have to do in these, these times of crisis. So I, I, I applaud you on it. Thank you. You know, um, I mean, Lynch there and everybody, Dwight, I mean, everybody and all the presidents, I'm not telling you every day it's just a perfect day where everybody's smiling with each other, but you know, there's a lot of, um, this is taking a, this is just different. I mean, this is very different in, in the way we've been changing our operations. I'm very, I'm very proud of everybody. I think that at the end, 
you know, we're able to tell right now what's essential and what's not essential. And well, once we get through all this, then we'll do some more. We'll take a look at everything. But um, thank you all for your support, by the way. We we can't do this unless the board is on board with what we're trying to do and, ma and making sure and many of you have been sending me notes, which I, it's actually been pretty helpful to me. So, um, Jennifer, you want to move on to your the piece of it? And just so you'll know, I think I've said this before, but so we've been taking a look at this. If I, if I could just break it down, we're going from point A to point B to point C. And we've always got our eyes on FY22. FY22, which is two years out. So, but the way we we think about the budget is what's going on this year, and what's going on next year, and then the year after that, because that will be the year where we start. Really, I think a lot of this, and uh, Mike Stoma, you, I mean, you you're keeping up. I mean, a number of you are. Mike Sullivan and Mike Stoma are keeping up with what this looks like downstream, and that's what we're looking looking at also. So basically, we're okay for this year, and we're okay for next year. But I'm gonna let Jennifer walk through that so you can see this. And things have changed a lot because the state, um, we were not included in the reductions right now. So we were one of the uh, small group of people that were deemed essential, a small group of offices that were deemed essential by the governor, community colleges were. So we were left out of this initial uh, reduction in the budget. So Jennifer, go ahead. Yes, can everyone hear me? I just wanna check that first. Okay, um, so first, if actually could I, if I could take this moment to mention procurement since they, uh, since Mario mentioned them. Uh, yeah, the procurement team, um, so the executive director is Cynthia Bright and her team, right from the get go has been great about sourcing all of the PPE. And then I wanna add that on top of that, right? Typically when new associate vice chancellors come on board, we introduce them to the board, um, so it only just now occurred to me that in the, so to let everyone know here that in the middle of all of this, um, so we had extended an offer uh, to her prior to spring break, but we have a new associate vice chancellor, Kathy Griffiths of supply management. And so she started in the middle of all this, right? So she has not stepped foot once in one of our offices um, and has had to meet her team and meet everybody over WebEx uh, but she has jumped right in working with uh, Cynthia Bright and that entire procurement team sourcing everything. Um, so she definitely has had an interesting start to joining Lone Star College. Um, but I do want to did want to sort of mention her that she started and definitely Cynthia Bright and that entire procurement team that's been doing that sourcing. Um, so definitely, like Mario said, for me too, it's we have great teams um, working through all of this. Um, and so then switching here to the budget impact in front of you, and I wanna mention Dr. Head said, we're looking at a two year window that we're looking out to FY22, mentioning that that's two years out. Um, but respectfully, I guess I wanna to mention too, right? We're close to the end of this fiscal year. So FY22 is actually only 15 months away. Um, so it sounds far away. It sounds like it's two years out, but it's really only 15 months from now. Um, and so you'll see uh, in a couple of slides here, uh, why it's important for us to make sure we're um, we're, we're looking ahead, um, but to kind of take this step by step. So just this first this remaining fiscal year, which is this summer, um, for fiscal year 2020, the total impact, the costs that we are currently estimating uh, of this is at 12 million. Um, this is a definitely a positive change uh, from what I presented to the board here about two weeks ago. This was at 19 million two weeks ago, with the primary difference being um, that state allocation, right? Two weeks ago, we were anticipating that allocation um, being reduced, and we have now gotten news that, at least for now, um, it's not being reduced. So I was able to remove that possibility. Uh, from these estimates. So that does put us at a tw uh, $12 million impact for this, the remainder of this current fiscal year. Um, to address that, we are utilizing CARES Act funds, um, about 10 million out of the 15 um, that we've received. And we've also done a uh, budget freeze of non-personnel expenses 
and a hiring freeze. Um, and right now we're estimating about 7.7 .7 million in savings from that. So Jennifer, before you move on, let's make sure we, we cover the 5% the decline. We left that in there, why we left it in there, and what's different about that, how that changes that picture. Yeah, so, I mean, Frank, uh, that was left in there because literally yesterday our reports was still showing a 5% decline. It was only this morning um, that that enrollment number changed to positive 5%. Um, so it, I think part of me wants to see that show up a positive 5% for a second time tomorrow morning first before I'm changing any of my spreadsheets. Um, but yes, yeah, so in here currently is a $1.1 million uh, estimate of, of a, a hit to revenue, a reduction in revenue if there's a 5% decline in the summer. Um, that number will switch to slightly positive, um, right, a positive impact if it's 5% growth. Um, now, if you remember when we built this year's budget, we had built it assuming a 2.5% enrollment growth rate. So we don't actually see, so if we grow two and a half percent, then we are, our revenue projections would be flat to the budget. Um, so in order to have um, an estimate that would be positive to the budget that this board approved last August, um, we would actually need to grow above two and a half percent. But still, you can see like just removing the 1.1 million alone, um, would reduce our costs uh, from 12 million down to 11. Um, so that would definitely have a positive impact on us of, a, of at least a mil somewhere between a million and a million and a half if we don't decline for the summer. Okay. Next slide, please. So like I said, just kind of going through the whole thing step by step, uh, that was this current fiscal year, which is the rest of the summer, and then starting next fiscal year, 2021, uh, this is currently what I'm estimating for the impact and the cost uh, of this. We are, of course, there's still additional expenses in here for PPE and continued online instruction. Um, right, the big variable into what next year looks like is fall enrollment. Um, so there right now we are estimating a 15% decline in fall enrollment and that would be a $19 million revenue reduction in next year's budget um, if, if we do have that 15% decline. For me, let me add one thing. So in our scenarios, and we, we have every scenario that you can imagine, including if a hurricane comes in and I actually, the way things were looking, I don't think we're going to have a 15% decline. I think it'll be a lot less than that if it's a decline at all. But um, we, we're we trying to look at worst case scenarios to be prepared. So a lot of the actions that you see are in preparation for what might happen. And talking to um, Dr. Smith before, and Jennifer and I have been talking a lot about, we want to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. It's always a lot easier for us to start adding money back in the budget if that's what we want to do instead of going into the year. And um, we're trying to be very, trying to be very pragmatic and very realistic about this. We know that we could have a decline. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, it could. So it just depends on whether the virus comes, you know, it depends on all these other things that you're seeing. So, go ahead, Jennifer. Yes, so, and especially with the timing being right now for the summer, right, we are currently building um, next year's budget that will be presented to the board in August for approval. Um, so internally, all of the areas need to turn in their budgets um, probably around um, mid to late June at the latest. So for building that budget, we have to make some of these decisions right now. And like Dr. Head said, it is easier for us to add add funds back next year once we get into it if they're available um, and and make the cuts now based on what we're currently seeing so that's why for these actions you know if there is that 15 percent decline we are doing five percent budget reductions and looking at continuing the hiring freeze um, that way we can go into next fiscal year um, planning for 15 percent decline 
and you know we, we can change it's easier to like dr had said to change course into the year if if in fall enrollment is is significantly better than a 15 percent decline so jennifer I mean, for the board just just keep in mind i mean the way we think about this is every percentage point is 1.2 million dollars 1.2 so if we if we pick up if say we're only minus five in the fall you can see that we just picked up uh, 10 percentage points. So we just picked up $12 million. So that's the way we're, I mean, from a money standpoint, that's the way we're taking a look at the, so. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, so that's $23 million um, in a possible impact on, on next year's budget. On the next slide, please. Jennifer. Yes. 15%. Are we 100% certain that there's nothing we can do to uh, change that or you know, deal with it or you know, use our skills or intellect, whatever. What is there? Is it impossible to to not, to make to change that? No, okay. If I, if, Trustee Lloyd, we are we are going all out on the marketing, and we've been reaching out to the ISD. As a matter of fact, I looked at an example of a postcard today that's going out to all households. Okay. So we really stepped it up on the marketing. Um, we're right now we're doing everything that I think we ought to be doing from a marketing standpoint. I I always think we can do more. I mean I. I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm looking at. I read the newspapers. I'm looking online. I want to see it on TV. I want to see it on the radio. I want people to know that we're still open for business, and we're going to be open. And I'm especially concerned about uh, first generation in college, and you're going to see more ads um, and more more marketing over the computers that we're ordering, so that people know we, we're trying to give them hope and letting them know to come into us. If money is the problem, come please talk to us. And and so there's a lot going on, I think, behind the scenes. I think what for the next board meeting, I'll get a list of all the things that we're doing. And reaching out for financial aid, I think that's a critical part of this. We're running behind about 5,500 applications or so for financial aid, and that's to me that has to do with the high schools getting out earlier, right? That, that normally would be working through the through, through the high schools. We still are, but we have a lot of work to do. I uh, to, so to answer your question, we put that number in there to help us from a budgeting standpoint, but I'm going to be disappointed if. If we're minus 15, I just think that's too much for us. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's kind of proving is, you know, what I think is people can talk about not doing all these things. They're all not going to go to school. I'm going to do this. Where are you going to go to work? And what are you going to be doing if you're not coming to school? So um, I think for us to make sure and for the students to know that we care about your safety and the parents to know that we're going to take care of you. If you come to school at Lone Star, we've got a number of different options for you. Hi, this is Mike Stoma. Just to, to, to uh, an aside thought, what you just said, Steve, you know, there, there are a number of graduates, you know, at the baccalaureate level and master's level, as you said, they're going to be looking for jobs and there's no jobs out there. We, we can talk all about that, Houston versus everywhere else. Um, maybe you should look at your marketing programs to target those types of graduates. It's kind of like my daddy used to tell me. My daddy used to say, man, boy, you need to learn a skill. You learn a skill, you can always fall back on it, no matter how educated you become. Yeah. So you you can talk uh, and start bring them back in to, to, to learn a skill where they can get a job. I mean, that's some, I, I'd encourage you to give that approach some thought. Yeah. We actually talked, uh... Trustee Saldivar is working with uh, Armando Wally, and the, the challenge for us is we we need a connection. I mean, we've been talking with her about this um, at Upskill Houston, and we would like for the employers to tell us what they need. What exactly do you need to get rebooted and so that we can funnel students and workers into those programs. So I, I agree with you though. So. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, so yeah, so just looking at, this here is the summary of, 
of sort of what I have as a draft outline in, in next year's budget is this estimated impact uh, of about 23 million and how we're looking to offset that. Um, there will be remaining CARES Act funds, right, for funds that are not being used this current year. Um, as I, and I mentioned continuing the hiring freeze um, and then also doing the 5% budget reduction uh, gets us to 23 million, gets us, you know, pretty much there for covering the current estimated impact on next year's budget. Uh, so this is this is how we're looking to manage that heading into next year. Next slide, please. But as I, as I mentioned, FY22 is right only about 15 months away. So we want to make sure we're continuing to look ahead um, and looking at all these different scenarios. So what you have in front of you um, are matrices of FY21 estimated cash reserve and FY22's estimated cash reserve, um, but they're at various different growth rates for both the summer and then this current fall. Um, so literally right here in front of you, you can see multiple different scenarios uh, of depending on how we end up growing the summer and then in the fall. So, I mean, for example, if summer ends up flat at 0%, um, and fall is down 15%, right? You can follow that over in FY21, we would be estimating an ending cash reserve balance of 18.5%. Um, and then if you go down to FY22, you would read this chart that same way. If you're assuming a flat 0% growth rate for the summer and a decline of 15% in the fall, you can see that, that the estimated cash reserve balance at the end of FY22 is 11.8%. So this is what uh, the tool I sort of built to, for us to be able to see multiple different growth rate scenarios. Um, and in this, I've included the 5% budget reduction that I mentioned we're planning for FY21. Um, also, assuming, as I mentioned, the, the state allocation, two weeks ago, right, we were estimating a significant impact in a reduction in that allocation this current year. Um, and now we found out that that's not going to happen. Um, but there's still a good possibility that there is a reduction at the next legislative session, which would occur in FY22. So a 5% reduction is assumed there. Um, now, part of the reason this is important to look this far ahead is because if there is a 15% decline in fall enrollments, uh, some of the items, some of those actions that we're using to cover that are one-time items. They're not recurring. So at that point, you have a misalignment between revenues and expenditures. And at the end of the day, we fundamentally have to have revenues and expenditures equal to each other. Um, so kind of where that misalignment uh, comes really upon us is in FY22, when at that point we've gone through the one-time sources, the CARES Act funds and the cash reserve balance itself. Um, and that's when you begin to see sort of our trajectory into the FY22 cash reserve. Um, the boxes that are in bold, the 18.3% and the 11%, that's just showing sort of where the prior slides was looking at. It was right, we had assumed a 5% decline in the summer and a 15% decline in the fall. So those um, boxes in bold inside of the matrix uh, shows where those prior slides kind of had us what scenario those were under. Um, but this allows you to see what it looks like at all these different growth rates. So Jennifer and board, so no matter what the summer enrollments are, and they are important to us from a financial standpoint, but if you go down to that bottom slide, we're okay for this coming year. We will be okay for this coming year with the, with the proposed budget reductions that we have. If the following year, if for this fall, if we're minus 10 or better, then you can see that we're going to be in the green. If you go down to that bottom slide, the green is where we want to be. So, um, again, our target, I think our target's better than minus 15 and minus 10. Our target is to grow, actually. But if we can get into that minus 10 and better, then we're going to be in good shape for the next two years. That's kind of the way we're looking at it, but that's with um, 
that really is with a stripped down budget right now. So I, I keep saying everything depends, but it depends on this fall enrollment. That, that's what we're really focused on. That'll determine how we do for the next two years. So. Any questions about this? This changes every day. I mean, by the way, we, we take a look at this every day and these charts seem to change every day just because of the enrollments and that's what's going to happen. Taking a look at these uh, matrices like this is almost taking a look at the stock market every day. It just goes up and it goes down and it may drop for two days or the enrollments and then they go back up again. It just depends on um, and the more word we get out, Trustee Lloyd, and the more and I mean not just in that kind of a marketing. I'm talking about marketing through civic organization, churches, any any organization so we get students enrolled and let them know that we're here and we're going to help them so. yeah i just want to make sure we, we're playing to win and we're not playing to not lose no we're playing to win excellent so steve mike's all <laughs> everybody else we do I, i'm uh and <clears throat> and i i think you know when i look at that minus 15 i just yeah i just can't see the intellect and all the people that we have that we just can't we, we can't we can we can prevent that from happening we should be able to say no way that's not going to happen steve mike Sullivan. Yeah, definitely just trying to be i mean in our other scenarios you know we have a slight chance of a hurricane but we've built that into our other scenario we've got other scenarios in the budget so when we as we start meeting throughout the summer We'll have a chart, but it's this chart's going to change a little bit. The numbers can change, so based on that, based on those enrollment. What I'm hoping is the next time we meet, we're down below ten, a negative ten. We're down below that. Question. So. Any other questions for? Uh, yes, sir. Mike Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, the chart information is good. It's helpful. Uh, good job on the marketing, by the way. I mentioned it last time we were in a zoom meeting all together something just popped in my head and, and that's the computers that are being purchased uh, for our students and then that also made me wonder about books and support for the bookstore and what students might need from the bookstore i don't mean pens and pencils talking about uh, instructional support uh, sure. and then any idea on how our new fee structure is playing out that's a little behind the scenes, probably for most people, maybe too early to tell what the positive impact might be. On our, I didn't hear the very last on how the what. The new fee structure that we approved, distance learning, all the all the fees to go away with them and wrap them up into our tuition. Um, let me do this in two parts. Link, do you want to talk just for a minute about the computers and when they're coming in and how we're going to set that up? Yes, sir. Um, Trustee Sullivan. So, at the, at the present time, and board, at the present time, we have 5,000 computers that will be arriving at the very end of June. They take about a week to get them prepped and packed for students. We're going to be including instructions on what software they have available to them and uh, get them going, you know, not just hand them a computer and say, here you go. Uh, we'll go through a process where they'll be checked out. They have an opportunity for a boot camp process. So as it stands right now, we're probably looking at mid to end of July, which would be perfect timing to get ready for the fall start. Uh, we have to work with each college on how we're going to do that allocation piece. So once they come in, then we have another 1,000 computers coming pretty close behind that, uh, that will be arriving probably at the end of July. We are still having some supply challenges. I'll be straightforward. Uh, I'm on calls regularly and I hear different lead times uh, from our main suppliers. Uh, on a regular basis. Link's done a great job of managing. We got in early on those orders and he's got a system set up and we're going to treat them like library books. We're still waiting on a, I need some, uh, an answer from the Department of Ed over whether or not we can give those to students if they complete a degree or certificate or a certain amount of hours. So, Jennifer, do you want- Hey, that's good on the computers. How about on, so go back to that. Yeah, Jennifer, we've been we've had a number of meetings with the bookstore and talking about what to do with the bookstore. Jennifer, you want to give them an update on the where we are with the bookstores, the way those are going to operate? 
yeah, so the bookstores, um, especially for the fall, um, we are still, uh, so there, I mean, like Mario said, like everyone's kind of taking this, you know, two weeks at a time. Uh, Barnes Noble and I, we've, we've had discussions about different options for what level of operations we have the bookstores at in, in the fall, um, right? Trying to make sure we have the ability to, to kind of switch be or decide between are we reopening the bookstores for students to physically come on campus to, or can we keep the Barnes and Noble operation online, right? Right now they are operating online. Students go to their website and order their books and they're shipped uh, at no charge to the, the student's house. Um, I think the main place there where we're seeing a challenge with students is when they're rental books and then the student has to return them. Um, even Barnes and Noble has provided shipping labels right free of charge for them to ship the books back but we're still having students show up at campuses anyway attempting to return them not realizing that our campuses are not open to just all students to come on come on site um, so that's where we're trying to evaluate like what aspects of their services of barnes and noble's operations uh, need a face-to-face -face co component versus what can remain online so we're still talking through that for fall looks like okay steve can i go back to the computers just for a moment yes yes i don't think there's any better opportunity to promote who lone star is and how we care about our students than that um last couple of weeks i've noticed in the afternoon news segments there have been video stories of hisd and other school districts handing out computers to families and they show them loading them in the car and the whole bit it's a great opportunity and you know i'll Leave that in your hands. I think it's something we should capitalize on. Okay. Thank you. Steve, I have one more question. You have a 15% worse uh, work case. Right. Do you have like a plus eight, 10% best case? In other words, increase. Well, we were originally budgeting. What do we have in there? A two point five or three three uh, percent? Yeah, prior to coronavirus hitting, uh, we were looking at assuming either a two or two and a half percent enrollment growth next year um, or this fall. Okay. So to answer your question, though, to me, the answer right now is the parents. That's the parents, and I think I really do think when reality sets in. I'm just not sure how many parents or even students want to go off to colleges. I think, I, again, I think we could see a surge in enrollment. I think this next month is going to be telling for us. I think that we'll start seeing now that the not everyone's graduated from high school yet, by the way. So we think in this uh, in June, we're going to see a surge in enrollments. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? So this is uh, some key dates and we'll send this out, but just to make sure. So we've moved, we've been moving the meetings around to try to make sure we've got time to prepare. But so June the 18th would be the regular. Normally we don't meet in July, but just given the circumstances, we thought we might want to put a, a to be determined so we can see what the enrollments look like. Because that'll make a it's not so much the summer enrollments as it is the fall, and then we can make some adjustments there. I don't the way things are looking in the preparation. So normally we would have the August meeting on the first week in August, but we want to move that back because we're just not going to have enough time to put the budgets together. And it looks to me like we'll get back on schedule um, the in October if we want to. And that just uh, it depends on if you want to meet in person or not. We've looked at some different scenarios how we could set that up, and I, it's it, my standard answer on everything right now. It just depends on whether the virus is still around, whether people feel safe or not, whether you feel like we're getting things done. I think that I know we have business to conduct, and then the the big one, of course, is going to be in January with the legislative session. And, Knowing what it looks like with state budgets, we'll have a little better idea about that. So we'll keep you informed. Make sure that you get these on your on your calendar. 
But again, the key for us is uh, these fall enrollments. Once we start seeing in the next in the next couple of weeks what the fall enrollments look like, then we can do a little better planning. And we'll, we we know we've got some uh, some issues that the board needs to be reviewing, some policy changes. So we'll bring those up on the June eighteenth uh, meeting. Now, Steve, may I jump in when you um, when you have a moment? Wait, say that again. Uh, I'd like to jump in if I may, Mike Sullivan. Sure. sure. Yeah, uh, we're talking a whole lot about Lone Star. I just wonder, what are your colleagues around the state experiencing right now? Do you have any idea or any? Yeah. Yeah. Behind yeah. The, these discussions. Yeah. We're we're in uh, regular communication with them. As a matter of fact, I was on phone call earlier this week or uh, WebEx with the Houston area, but. You know, we're still active with the state association, but there's about three or four of us that I think are pretty well run and they were before. If you were in good shape before the pandemic, you're in pretty good shape right now. And the ones that are in the best shape were the board policy. They had a board policy about reserves. They were pretty conservative in their estimates one way or another. But even before this started, there were a number of colleges that um, it, it's it's just been the kind of the shifting of of um, which colleges are the most efficient and effective. And I mean, I think for us, we're in the business of teaching and learning, but there's a money part of this. If you don't get the money right, then you can't do the other things. And so we're. Um, there are four or five of us that I think are in really good shape to um, come through this and still be sound at the end of it because of our previous planning. It's not just the planning piece, it's board policies that we've had about reserves and how we're going to spend. So, yes, I do. I, we're, we're in that group that I think is staying very positive. And Trustee Lloyd, I agree with you. We're not on the... I'm, I personally am not going to be happy and if we're down that's just not going to work i mean we we know that these students are sitting out there we know that they, they need to come to school we know that so of the, excuse me of the 26 buildings is each how many recruitment centers are what's where are we with respect to a recruitment network or whatever um, how, how do we look there as far as the recruitment do we have a, a group set up or you know etc something we're doing it two different ways each okay. of the colleges um, is responsible for their own individual area but we are recruiting across the we're reaching out to all the superintendents so we we do it as a really a partnership so the system office um, has the larger budget so we do the mass marketing and we do the outreach, uh, any kind of communication, whether it be written, TV, radio, we take care of that. The colleges can do and supplement whatever they want to locally. We have been uh, sending out notices from the system office, postcards, and email, a lot of emails. The colleges are also following up on that. I know a number of the colleges are, are calling every one of their students, especially when they're not paying. So it's a, it's a joint effort. I don't. I think we're doing everything we need to be doing right now that we could be doing. So, Mike Sullivan, did I answer your question about? You, you uh, did, and you addressed it from a financial uh, perspective. I was it, it was not very clear. I was thinking as to whether or not other community colleges currently are experiencing uh, what their enrollment numbers might be. Do we have any idea what that looks like around the state? Yeah. Most of them are looking at enrollment declines. That's what their concern is. And so um, I think they're asking the state for some assistance. And I, I think that at least for us, uh, the state, we're all in the same boat here. All of us are. So, um, I, in my mind, we need to take care of what we can take care of here. And if the state comes back and can help us, but the way I'm seeing things right now with state revenues down, I don't think you can be counting on that. I just don't think you can be counting on that. So, and I don't know about the federal government. There may be another stimulus, but I was told uh, yesterday that if it's anything for colleges, it would be late in the summer. 
And I just don't think you can count on that either. It just, um, if it happens, that's good. If not, I think you, you, we know what we need to do here. We know what we need to do at Lone Star to get in good shape. I think that there's some major, major concern out there. I, I will, uh, especially with the smaller colleges that are in these smaller towns where assessed value was, may have been dropping anyway, and they just, they don't have assessed value and they have been, their taxes were pretty high anyway. You know, we're in the middle, for, we're actually below in our taxes, below the median. So they can't, you can't raise taxes and certainly can't raise tuition right now. So they're, they're in a financial jam right now. Okay, thank you. Well, it looks like an enrollment is what's going to have to take place, and we're going to have to be very aggressive about it. That is the key. Right. I agree. So, uh, Mr. Chair, that's it for us. If people have questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, we you can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes. There's a couple of things. I was, I was uh, you know, based up on feedback that I that I have received and et cetera. And I kind of you know, wrote a short uh, deal on to summarize that. And basically, what I'm hearing folks say on the outside is they like the way that you and your staff have worked on the safety and well-being of all of the students and the employees. They like what you guys have done to make sure that our students are successful, you know, getting the hours or the certification that they're working on. Uh, based on my observations also, I believe that the administration and the board have been focused and have leveraged all college resources to the two purposes of making sure everyone was safe and that students were success are successful. Uh, this pandemic has showcased to me at least our core values is to unify efforts to provide equity and support to students, staff, and the community to meet their college mission. I believe that we all shine when we work together you know, as a unit, and I think we have done that, and I want to thank you and your staff and the board for helping us do that. So keep up the good work. Thank you. I'd like to add. Thing, the other thing I want to mention also, one of our police officers passed on, on May the 23rd. Uh, his name is Kevin Ward Swatzel, and he's been with us for quite a while and keep him and his family in your prayers. Dr. Smith, one last thing. Um, we couldn't be doing this if our faculty weren't helping and they are helping a lot. They have really been, and we're working on, uh, I didn't mention some of it, but we're, we're working on faculty workloads. For example, if somebody's gonna be teaching face-to-face -face and maybe they only have 10 people in their class and they teach five classes, that's 50. If they're teaching online, they can have twice that many at least so mm -hmm. our person is leading a group over that so we'll we'll share that with you yeah. probably at the next meeting but i would tell the board we we know that this is an unusual period so if somebody is getting hung up in our system please let us know you can send a note to helen to me to one of the presidents um it's been we've got people in and out of the office and we're trying to respond to telephone calls and i think we've done it We've done a pretty good job of that, but still, I, I realize for a lot of the students, this is new for them also. It's very disruptive. It's very disruptive for everybody. So let us know if somebody, if we're not, we haven't responded or somebody can't get in touch with us or just doesn't know what to do. So, All right. Okay. At this point, do we have any future agenda items that we haven't heard about already that, that you would like to have included? If not, it is now 309 and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for for your Thank efforts you. and have a good week yeah. and take be safe. Thank you all. Great yeah. job. Thank you. Let's see how I'll get off of this thing.